Well, this morning we continue in the central section of Luke, that section that involves the journey to Jerusalem. And as you remember, Jesus is teaching along this journey. Luke emphasizes Jesus' teaching and the events that Jesus encounters serve as a foundation on which that teaching can be set. Um, We're going to be looking at Luke chapter 11, beginning in verse 37. It's on page 1030 of the Pew Bibles. I'd love for you to find that and to follow along as, uh, as we look at this text. Gracious Father, we thank you for the blessing it is to approach your word. We pray that pray that you will open it to us. We pray that your Holy Spirit will be here, moving among us, moving within us, and teaching us what you have for us today. We pray in the name of Jesus the Christ. Amen. Well, in verses 37 and 38, Luke gives us the setup for the discussion We read that Jesus finished speaking, and a Pharisee invited him to table. So Jesus went in and he reclined. It's important to remember how dinner works at this period of time. Jesus reclined. This means that the bench on which he and the others would be eating was there, low to the floor. Jesus would have lain down on his left side on the bench. His knees would have been bent at a right angle. Feet would have been sticking out right behind him. He would have rested his head on his left hand this way and would have reached out to eat with his right hand. This is the position in which all of these guests would have been eating this meal. So Jesus comes in, he reclines at the table, and the Pharisee, his host, is surprised when he sees that Jesus didn't wash before the meal. This doesn't mean that Jesus' hands were dirty and he should have cleaned them off. This is a ritual of cleansing, a ceremonial cleansing that washes off the uncleanness of the outside. So so we read that beginning in verse 39, Jesus begins to teach about the Pharisees. And he starts in 39 through 41 talking about cleanness. Neither the host nor anybody else remarks out loud that Jesus has foregone this ritual cleansing. But Jesus speaks aloud to their silent thoughts, their silent criticisms. And the Lord said to him, now you Pharisees clean the outside of the cup and the dish, but inside... You're full of greed and wickedness. Well, it's quite a way to talk to your host, isn't it? If any of you ever come to dinner at my house, I'm hopeful that the conversation will not go that way. But Jesus knows their thoughts. He knows their hearts. He says your external appearance is really important, but what's inside doesn't matter to you. The only thing that matters to you is what people can see. In verse 40, he says, you foolish people, didn't the one who made the outside also make the inside? Now, for what's inside of you, for you gathered at this meal, what's inside of you with respect to that, be generous to the poor. Give to the poor, make sure the poor have something to eat and everything will be clean with you. Notice it doesn't say only the inside will be clean. He says everything will be clean with you if your internal transformation is showing in everything that you do. Jesus accuses the Pharisees of putting on an exterior of faithfulness to God but not being transformed in the love of God. This idea of transformation, of inner transformation, is going to be taking place throughout this passage. Jesus' instruction is this, live as one who is beloved of God. Live like one who is beloved of God. Because it is God's love 
that makes you clean, not a ceremonial washing. Well, then in verse 42, we come to a passage about tithing. Jesus says, Woe to you, Pharisees. And I want to remind you, uh, Mark has heard this already. I'm going to use Mark as my example. We hear that, woe to you, and we sort of hear in our minds, woe, woe to you, Mark. And this doesn't convey the thought at all. When Jesus says, woe to you, what he says is, how tragic for you. How heartbreaking it is for you. How heartbreaking, you Pharisees, because you give God a tenth of your mint, of your rue, all kinds of garden herbs, but you neglect justice and you neglect the love of God. He says, you've taken the things in the Torah which were for the joy and the blessing of God's people and you've turned them into burdens that don't care at all for the spiritual health of the people. They ensure a kind of uniform external practice of obedience that doesn't engage the heart at all. He says, you should have, you should have practiced the latter. You should have practiced justice. You should have practiced love of God. You should have practiced all of these things, justice, love of God, without leaving the former undone. He says there's nothing wrong with tithing. Tithing is perfectly good. But it's only good if it's in the spirit and the focus of people's joyous response to God. It has to be internal, not external. Then in 43, he talks about status and reputation. He says, how tragic for you, you Pharisees. You love the most important seat in the synagogue. You love to be up there in front where people can see you where people can see your newest robe, where people can see how sincere you are. You love people to see you. You love those greetings in the marketplace. You love for people to come up to you and bow low and honor you. You love it when people show you honor and respect. How tragic for you. It's so important to you that people recognize the externals rather than that which is internal to you. And then in 44, he talks about unmarked graves. And, and this becomes harder to hear. This is a harder message to hear. He says, how tragic for you because you're like unmarked graves. At this time, graves were clearly marked. A grave, and remember they were often into, into a hill, not down in the ground. Graves were clearly marked with whitewash. They were marked very plainly because if you happened to brush up against a grave, you were ceremonially unclean, and you stayed unclean until you had gone through the ritual of cleansing. And so they were clearly marked so that you would avoid touching them. He says, how tragic for you. You're like unmarked graves that people walk over and they don't even know it. By the things you do, even though you think you're so clean, the things you do, you not only make yourselves unclean, you make the people who follow you unclean as well. How tragic for you. Well, at this point, an expert in the law speaks up. We need to remember that the experts of the law, these are not lawyers who practice in court, although our translations will often say lawyer. These are the people who devoted their lives to the study of the Torah. They knew every word. They knew every point of the law. They knew it all. And one of these experts stands up and says, Teacher, when you say these things, you insult us also. What's going on here is that a, a large number of those experts in the law were Pharisees. They were members of the Pharisee party. And this expert in the law is saying, Jesus, what you're saying is probably true of those other Pharisees. Those others, you're absolutely right about them, but 
when you say that, because some of us who are experts in the law, we're Pharisees as well, you're accidentally insulting us as well. And, and you probably want to correct that. Well, Jesus is just getting started. So now, since the teacher in the law has spoken up, Jesus says, let's talk about you teachers of the law for a little while. And in verse 46, he talks about burdens. He says, you experts in the law, how tragic for you, how heartbreaking for you. You have loaded the people down with burdens they can hardly carry. And you yourselves will not lift a finger to help them. It's important to remember what we're talking about here. There is the Torah, the teaching of God. And then there are these fences that are built around the Torah, these rules and regulations that are set up to make sure if you don't do this, if you don't cross this line, then you won't be in danger of violating the Torah. That's what these fences do, and it's often described in that way. And here's an example. The Torah says, honor the Sabbath and keep it holy. Honor the Sabbath. Well, it means you're supposed to rest on the Sabbath. It means you're not supposed to work on the Sabbath just like any other day. But how are you going to know what's okay and what's not? How are you going to know what you can do and what you can't? Don't you have to have some rules? Don't you have to have some, some clear ideas? As an example, what can you carry? Can you carry stuff on the Sabbath? Can you carry anything you want to? When does it become work? When does it not work? And so a fence is established to help understand what is and is not a violation of the Sabbath. And so what can you carry? Well, the rules are developed, and a rule says you will not violate the Sabbath if you carry a weight such that if you take a cloth bag and you open the mouth of the bag and you hold it upside down, Whatever doesn't fall out is an amount that's legal to carry on the Sabbath. Or here's another example. You can carry, you can be safe within the Sabbath if you carry the amount that will fit in your ear and not fall out. See, these fences were put together with all good conscience to keep you from violating the Torah, but necessarily they become burdens that people can't bear up under. Ultimately, it's impossible to bear up under them. And this is what Jesus is saying. You've set these burdens, you've created these burdens, and you just let people struggle and suffer under them. And Jesus is still not finished with the experts in the law. In verses 47 through 51, he starts talking about the prophets. And he says in 47, how tragic for you, you experts in the law, you who regard yourselves as so much better and so much cleaner and so much more faithful than everybody else, how tragic for you. Because you build tombs for the, tro for the prophets, and it was your own ancestors who killed them. He says, you testify that you approve what your ancestors did. They killed the prophets and you build monuments to them. See, the thing that's happening here is that when the prophets were alive, the prophets were just a pain in the neck. The prophets were always saying, this isn't what God wants you to do. God wants you to be faithful. God wants you not to, to be worshiping other gods. The prophets are calling the people back to God and nobody wants to hear it. The prophets are just a real pain while they're alive. But once they've been dead for a few generations, now they're completely harmless. And it's safe to build a big monument to them. Oh, we love these prophets. Now that they're dead, now that they're harmless, we love these prophets. Jesus says in verse 49, because of this, God in his wisdom said, I will send them prophets and apostles and some some they will kill and others they will persecute. See, building monuments to the prophets is a good, safe, external response 
without any inward conviction of guilt. So in beginning in verse 50, Jesus starts talking about the responsibility of that generation, the generation Jesus is speaking to. He says this generation will be responsible for blood, the blood of all the prophets that's been shed from the beginning of the world, from the blood of Abel to the blood of Zechariah. We remember probably that Cain and Abel were the first children, and they both brought offerings to God, and Abel's offering was acceptable, and Cain's offering was not, and Cain killed Abel. That was the first of these martyrs. And then he carries that through to Zechariah, killed between the altar and the sanctuary. This is a story that we read in 2 Chronicles chapter 24. And we read that there was a good king in Judah, King Jehoiada, who was a good king. When he died, the officials in Judah persuaded his successor, King Jehoash was his successor. The officials persuaded King Jehoash that it would be fine to offer to some other gods. It would be fine to make an offering to Baal or to some of these other gods. It would be fine. And this, and this um, Asherah pole, this stylistic form of a woman, it would be fine to put that by the altar. That would be fine. It's no problem. And King Jehoash listens to them and prophets come. God sends prophets to correct them, but no one listens to the prophets. And then the Spirit of God came on Zechariah. Zechariah was the son of good king Jehoiada. And he accuses the officials of forsaking God. And he says, in your forsaking God, you are inviting God to forsake you. Well, it didn't go over very well. The people did not want to hear it. And so King Jehoash approved that Zechariah should be killed there in the temple. The traditional understanding at the time of Jesus was that Zechariah had actually been killed between the altar and the sanctuary, and Jesus makes this event accessible to them so that his larger point about the deaths of the prophets, how unwelcome the message of the prophets is because it calls for inner transformation of people. He says, Jesus says to the teachers of the law, this generation will be held responsible for it. The only way to be cleansed of this guilt is to be transformed by the love of God in Jesus Christ. That's the only way of transformation. Well, then in 52, Jesus talks about the key to knowledge. He says, how tragic for you experts in the law, because you've taken away the key to knowledge. You yourselves have not entered in, and you have hindered those who were entering. See, the experts in the law had the responsibility of showing people the love and the grace of God. This is the knowledge that the people so desperately needed. He says these law experts have found more and more ways to make God's love an unbearable burden rather than the delightful response to God's love. And in verses 53 and 54, we see the aftermath. Jesus leaves the table and he goes outside. The Pharisees and the teachers of the law start to oppose him fiercely and they ask him question after question after question waiting to catch him in something he might say. They figure if we ask enough questions, hard enough questions, complicated enough questions, he will trip himself up and then we will have him. See, it's a problem when we take on God incarnate and try to trip him up. But that's their effort. That's their plan. Catch him doing something wrong, and then we can be rid of him. Well, what can we ourselves this morning take away from this passage? Last week, I asked you questions and invited you to answer them aloud. This time, 
I'm going to invite you to just reflect on these questions at least. So I want to ask, what are the things, including perfectly nice, good things, what are the things we do so that other people will have a good opinion of us? What are the things we do so other people will say, oh, oh, that John, how good. What are the things we do? Jesus accuses the Pharisees of acting this way. Jesus accuses the Pharisees of putting on a good front so everybody would like them and respect them. In what ways am I the same? In what ways are you the same? That's the first question. Here's the second one. What things, including perfectly good and nice things, do you and I do so that we will have a positive opinion of ourselves? What are the things we do to make ourselves feel just so holy, so upright? The experts in the law held a very high opinion of themselves. The one who spoke up to Jesus, and don't you think he wishes he had kept his mouth full of food instead of speaking up, says, oh, you can't possibly mean us. With these criticisms, I'm sure you mean them, but you can't possibly mean us. What are the things we do to polish up our own image just to make ourselves feel better? Well, the third question has to do with people like me who are reared in traditions. Remember, I, I couldn't even spell Presbyterian until I was somewhere in my 20s. I was reared in a tradition that emphasized salvation by works, by being faithful enough, by being good enough, by praying hard enough, by going to church enough to please God and earn salvation. That's the kind of tradition I was reared in. For people like us, what things, including perfectly good things, do we do to earn or to deserve God's love? How quickly we forget that God's love for us shown most perfectly in the life, the atoning death, and the resurrection of Jesus the Christ, how often we forget that that cannot be earned or deserved. It is God's gift of grace, freely given to us. See, my friends, as God continues to transform us, we continue to do good things, but the motivation changes radically. Now we do these good things and more indifferent good things, including good things that are way outside of our comfort zone. We do them not to be seen by other people. We do them not to make ourselves feel better. We do them not to earn God's love because we know we can't. We do them because in light of how God has already loved us, we can't not do them. This morning, will you look to see how God is transforming you? Can you see the ways God is transforming you on the inside? Will you praise God for what God has done and is doing in your life this morning? God changes us. God cleanses us on the inside and on the outside. May my life and may your life testify to this transformation. Amen.